Welcome to our channel. Due to COVID-19 epidemic, our life has changed a lot. And we would be seeing more changes in coming months and years. Presently, every business is under stress. Every organized and unorganized activity is at halt and lockdown. And one of the important pillar of democracy, judiciary is partially paralyzed to a large extent. To ensure that democracy survives, we will have to bring back judiciary in action. And accordingly, many new ideas are implemented. The plan to take physical courts into virtual courts is in action and in coming months we may see that happening. Now uh, there was a seminar hosted by Consumer Court Advocates Association. Uh, guest was Honorable Bombay High Court Justice Gautam Patel. Now let's actively listen to Honorable Justice of Bombay High Court Gautam Patel regarding the upcoming modus operandi of litigation in Indian courts. They're all mentioning will only be on a VC connection. What exactly that means, I'll discuss uh, briefly. This will also mean that your kursis or your recipe or your application or memo, whatever you want to call it, will have to be sent in electronically because there is no possibility of handing it up to the judge. Those systems will have to be put in place and this necessarily requires lawyers at every level to adapt to these requirements. You will not have a choice. In that. Now, I have understood from some preliminary questions that uh, Mr. Varunjikar said to me that there are some concerns and they are very real concerns about this personal infrastructure and electronic infrastructure. Let me explain a couple of things because there is a lot of uh, mythology and unnecessary clutter about this. It is not necessary that you have very high end equipment. But you must accept as a starting mantra that you that every advocate who intends to continue practice must have basic infrastructure in place and must be unafraid to use it. I'm not talking about the kind of high-end infrastructure that some of the large law firms have. And if you notice in a lighter vein that the size of a law firm is inversely proportional to the length of its name. The larger the law firm, the shorter its name. As you have undoubtedly noticed, in very large law firms have names that are no more than two or three letters. I wonder why. I never have been able to understand that. What you do require is basic infrastructure, a computer that works, it can be a laptop, it can be a tablet, it can be an entry-level PC, it does not have to be very expensive. And you require a phone, you don't require multiple devices. It is ideal if you have multiple devices, but it is not essential if you combine this with paper, you can manage. What you do need is internet connectivity because without this, it is going to be very difficult. You need a 4G connection. There are solutions available and will be made available by the court and that is the responsibility of the court. For those who do not have stable or sufficiently high speed network to have facilitation centers that they can go to to use the facilities there, that will undoubtedly have to be place because that is part of the access to justice mechanism and we cannot tell people if you do not have bandwidth, sorry, you do not have access to justice. That is just simply untruthful. But for greatest efficiency, you will need to use this. And now let's look at some of the software. You don't, do not need expensive scanning software or in fact even expensive scanners. The great thing about mobile phone technology is that with many of these apps, you have perfectly workable solutions and many of them are offered free with some limitations on your phones. Even scanning is entirely possible. It is possible to generate a document and transmit it from the phone to a designated email address. All of this is entirely possible and can be done. Yesterday, as we noticed, 
the Supreme Court announced and launched its e-filing module and I don't know how many of you attended that, it was very interesting. It's a comprehensive dashboard and here are just two or three things that Justice Chandrachot uh, mentioned and I'll just put them here because some of you may not have uh, been there. It is an online facility where you upload your document which means that you have to have a document in PDF. So you have to have that basic software with you. And there are enough free PDF generators. There could be other formats as well. But what that online dashboard does is that it allows you not only to add to your filing, initiate the initial filing, then add to those filings, but also see what others have filed in your matter. So whether you are for the petitioner or the respondent or the claimant or the opponent makes no difference. An online portal when deployed gives you access to the entire record digitally. You can then download it, you can use it, you can print it, not print it, the choice is yours. It's great flexibility. The other great thing about it is that it is tied to the court fee payment system. So it eliminates the need to stand in line to get the cancellation of a court fee stamp. There is an online integrated system for payment of court fee. And the best thing which Justice Chandrachot mentioned and was mentioned again in the demo that followed is that this is a facility that is available to you unlike a court office 24-7 round the clock. You can file at any time of your convenience. You are not rushing to meet the 5 o'clock deadline or the 4.30 deadline or the 4 o'clock deadline before the court filing office shuts down. Registrations and memos are also sent to you electronically so you have some control and I expect that as this evolves, you will see the objection system also being handled online and the entire system is then taken in a remote online fashion. This is the one thing that will happen with filings, which as many of you know, is not only a time consuming task, but is a laborious task because it involves getting affirmation, stamp, notarizing notarization if you can if you are allowed that going to the court office making sure and then the follow-up now all of this if digitized solves the problem at one end but it does require you to have that basic access software if you do not have it there are facilitation centers but it is most optimal if you have at least the basic that is required the other thing that will change are courtrooms uh, there will be less fewer people. Your bar rooms, I have no idea what will happen. But I do not think that they will be usable in the manner in which they were used before. If your bar rooms are combined with libraries, then one of the things that is necessarily going to happen is that you are going to have to gain access to online research databases because your access to courts and large libraries may be severely constrained. You will have perhaps an appointment system. And for those who do need to do filings online or need to access a library, an appointment pre-scheduled system is I think going to be inevitable and is coming. So you should plan on this. The by the way, on the technology, let me tell you, uh, I fully anticipate and the Financial Express today in fact has a very interesting news item that we will no longer be struggling with these multiple platforms, somebody on video, somebody on Webex, somebody on uh, Google Meetings, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, whatever it is. There is a initiative to have a dedicated video conferencing facility, India specific, specific to our needs and the expressions of interest that have been received are overwhelming. So it is very likely that we will all be on a common platform. All right. How does this change advocacy? Well, there are the plus points and the minus points. The plus points first, it cuts out the stress of travel if we can deploy 
some level of VC hearing even in a hybrid fashion intelligently. Let me explain what that means. Even if courts fully resume, we can perhaps evolve a system where for advocates who come from out of town, we can schedule VC hearings so that they do not have to incur, or they and their clients, the litigants, do not have to incur the additional costs of traveling to the city, especially for appeals and matters that have reached the high court level. They do not have the additional burden, they and their litigant clients, of engaging separate counsel and representation in the larger metros. Now, that may not be a great thing for the advocates in the larger metros, but from the perspective of the practitioner who is in a remote location and who has handled that matter for a year, two years, three years and knows it inside out, this could be a great advantage. I do hope that we are able to do this because I can see the enormous savings to the litigant and to the lawyer involved. And this is the good part of it. But as I said, it's a mixed bag because the lawyers in the larger metros will have to face the brunt of not having that steady pipeline of work coming to them. The nature of your advocacy is necessarily going to uh, change. Uh, let me tell you, the hearings on VC are not only significantly slower, and I found this from personal experience, than anything we could do in court, much slower. They're also much more stressful. Uh, there's this screen in front of you and you are, things are wobbling around and bobbling around and you are paying attention to chat and so on and so forth. Uh, it's also very distracting, let me tell you, in court, when you have so many video screens, all of which show some activity. By the way, let me pause there. One of the things that we are going to have to learn is how to conduct ourselves before a computer camera, which is to say, you must ensure stillness and you must ensure that your backgrounds are not cluttered and noisy. People make the mistake because they are looking at a speaker, they believe that nobody can see what's happening behind them. That's not true. As long as your camera is on, it picks up everything that is happening around you. So you need to be careful about what's happening in your background that can lead potentially to a very awkward situation. You have to be careful about how in a court environment you appear, whether you're seated, how you speak, how you dress and present yourself. Just because you are doing this from home doesn't make it any less a court. It has the same uh, requirements, it has the same demands, and it has the same gravitas and the same seriousness that you would bring to bear in a regular court of law. But because of the nature of the technology, your earlier style of advocacy is going to change at least two or three major aspects. One, the practice that in some courts at least we have of constantly interrupting the other side will have to stop. Uh, it's difficult enough in a court, but let me tell you, on video conferencing, it is absolutely hell for a judge when he is hearing a counsel address and somebody else is mic is on and he's trying to interrupt. It's going to be very difficult. You will have a system as we are seeing here where everybody is on mute and will be unmuted only when that turn comes. This necessarily means that your habits of advocacy have to be adapted to the new technology and culture. You are also going to have to learn one additional skill and judges are going to have to learn it and so are lawyers, which is that you are going to have to rely more and more on written notes of arguments. I'm not on the question of whether they go before or after, that is a matter. But in order to more or most effectively put your point across to the judge, you are going to have to resort to the alternative strategy of saying, 
I am putting my points, all of them, although I may argue in a VC hearing only the top two or three points, I have five, six and seven also to present. I am putting them in paper before the judge under my signature. The judges will have that much more to read. But if there's less listing, hopefully this is going to be possible. I want to come to one aspect which people don't talk about, but which is at the back of everybody's mind and which is going to affect everybody. What is going to happen to earnings and income in the legal profession? Okay, let's, I'm not one to beat around the bush about things like this, but let's be clear about this. There is going to be an impact and it's going to be a severe and adverse impact on earnings. It's going to come from two directions. I'm expecting a situation where litigants will no longer be willing to pay the fees that they were willing to pay even as recently as January or February 2020. Volumes will also go down. How you are going to deal with this is not something I can predict, but it is something that we should plan on and let's not be coy or let's not shy away from addressing the monster in the room and this is going to happen. There are areas that are going to be more affected than others and as I said earlier, I am extremely worried about cases in certain specialized tribunals. I am worried about cases in, for example, the environment tribunals. How many will be able to afford those? I am particularly worried about cases in the service tribunals, both in industrial and labor tribunals, as also in courts like the consumer courts. Let me explain that briefly since we are before our hosts are the Consumer Courts Advocates Association. There is, as I understand it, the two essential, two or three essential ingredients to consumer court action is that you must have a service provider, there must be a service, a deficiency in service and a consumer. If any one of these parts is missing or is diminished, it affects the whole. If therefore you have reduced or cut back services, you will have necessarily reduced or cut back cases arising from disputes about the quality of those services. Now this could be airlines, because there may be fewer airlines, railways, insurance, any number of things. Everything that is otherwise covered under the consumer laws may well be affected affected for a long time to come. I'm not trying to upset anybody here, but I think this is the harsh reality that we will have to face. We'll have to ease ourselves back into a legal system, trying to approach to the extent that we can the old system that we knew. I do not know when if ever we will get back to that earlier system. I have my reservations about whether we will ever be able to get back there. But I'm confident that courts will open and sooner rather than later. Although in this staggered, scaled down form. Now put this all together. And what we have is a situation where you have increasing demands on your infrastructure for those who do not already have it. An increasing demand on your technical skill sets. You must learn how to deal with matters electronically for those who are used to dealing mostly in paper. And you have to balance this against a potential thinning or slimming down of work work volumes and client bases. Now this is not easy. The one good thing that the legal profession has 
is it has plenty of reserves which is to say it has the backlog that one thing that was everybody's favorite whipping boy is a whipping thing is now the one thing that can come back to some advantage to the legal profession and we can use this to start addressing that very problem because if there is to be or is likely to be a drop in new filings then we will have the time and the space and the means to start tackling some of those accumulated arrears of final hearing cases that's a very important consideration that will also mean that take for example a civil appeal where paper books are ready you will have a hybrid within a hybrid in the sense that there could conceivably be a situation where a final hearing is taken in by a vc but the judge or the court and the advocates though in remote locations are using actual paper and are not relying on electronic documents this is a hybrid within the hybrid and it is entirely workable and it is not with outside the realm of possibility and there is of course the other likelihood that when final hearings are listed because there are fewer people in a final hearing and the final hearings are given time slots there'll be fewer people in court so you will actually be able to get back into a court for a final hearing very like the final hearings that you could do in the earlier days uh one very technical caveat i must point out because people often don't realize this till very late we are talking about pdfs for electronic documents and physical papers please bear in mind the, that the one of the things that lawyers always rely on to get on with their work winds up in an enormous mismatch between physical paper and the digital version of the same document and i'm talking about page numbering what pdf does is that it counts every sheet whether it's the docket or a covering blank page is counted as page 1 to page n what we do in physical numbering is that we number selectively those portions that are that require meaningful page numbering now there are means in pdf to get around this there are num- complex numbering systems available and firms in america and overseas have teams of paralegals which only attend to the correct numbering of complex and very large pdf documents we don't have that that is one of the things that you are going to have to learn to deal with and i don't actually have an answer to how to deal with this because a document in your hands that is in paper that has page numbers from 1 to 50 might actually be a 65 or 75 page document in pdf because there are unnumbered sheets that still show up as pdf page numbers so directing the judge's attention to the relevant document will have to be not perhaps by page number but by use of another common reference and that again is a tool that we are going to have to evolve some working methodology some protocol between bar and bench to take this forward uh there were some questions that uh uday had uh, sent me earlier and i'm going to try and address them uh in a little while but uh, in a few minutes i'm not going to take very much longer uh i want to emphasize one thing though there are well two things actually one is that i am not despondent about the future mankind has survived we will survive we'll get through this will get through this but the emphasis is on this we must learn how to get through this together and not just individually which means that we will have to look out for each other as we carry on in our professions having said that i do believe it's going to be a rough ride it's not going to be easy and we are going to have all kinds of teething problems 
I believe the court administrations everywhere and whether they are engaging with the bar associations or not, I do not know. But court administrations everywhere are working with this one aim in mind. And again, Justice Chandrachud uh, mentioned this yesterday, which is that our primary focus has to be on access to justice. Our Chief Justice of India has said this repeatedly. And the challenge before us, therefore, is how to get this across in a time when normal systems and structures have broken down. This is what we are heading towards. Finally, let me tell you what I think is going to happen, which is that many of you are going to see an uptick and a surge in the number of cases being referred to mediation and arbitration. Wherever this is possible, this is going to happen because it actually serves all the purposes that you need. You get a dispute resolution mechanism, which is within the framework of the law. You can do this in a setting that doesn't require uh, the structures of courts. It addresses the question of social distancing and it can be managed in a more compact and easy fashion. So I am fully expecting many of you to start, uh, that many of you will find yourselves engaged in more mediation and arbitration work than you had anticipated or that you were used to doing in the time before. The te technological challenges, as I said, can appear daunting, but they are not insurmountable. Nothing is beyond our capacity as lawyers. We've all learned to deal with them. We, we dealt with typewriters when we began and we used to make carbon copies. Who makes a carbon copy? Now, if we've been able to do it, that this is the next step. We'll take it as a challenge. We'll take it positively and we'll move forward. I began by telling you a small narrative of where we were last December. I wish I could predict where I'm going to be next December. I cannot. I cannot tell you whether I will be with friends. I hope to be. I do not know when this is going to happen. But that we will get through this in some form or the other, I have no doubt. We will need from the advocates at the bar, and I'm now talking about our side as judges, a great deal of patience. There are things that will we will try that may or may not work, things that will go wrong. It's going to be a work in progress. Nobody has ever seen anything like this before. Uh, there will be issues that will come up now and then. And we are not going to be able to evolve a absolutely perfect system to replace or substitute or even work as a hybrid. Things will function differently at different levels. This is a work in progress. But if we do it and we do it together, respecting each other's safety and concerns, I think we can get through this as one. Thank you very much for listening. I'll take any questions that you may have now. Sir, uh, uh, what we did, uh, we invited questions uh, while registration. And as you indicated in the morning, uh, some questions uh, were uh, forwarded to you. I've got them. Shall, uh, I, shall is... I go through them one by one? Yes, yes, sir. Please, All right. please. All right. Uh, the first question is, what about remote locations where bandwidth and net speed is a problem? Very good question. Uh, I expect that what we are going to do and we identify those and we know some of those areas already. Uh, Maharashtra has no shortage of places where we have this issue. Uh, I think what we are looking at and that work and those discussions are already in place is that at the taluka and the district levels, there will be some form of a facilitation center which will have the necessary infrastructure where advocates can visit with the precautions that are in place and will be able to manage this to the extent necessary. Let me also explain this. Uh, if, for example, somebody from Nandurbar is trying to log into uh, a very remote court uh, at the high court level, that may present difficulties. But locally, within that district or within that taluka, 
they may not be such a problem and the facilitation centers will undoubtedly have to be put in place not just for advocates but also for litigants who may not have all the facilities that we expect uh, that's going to happen uh, then there is a question of whether there can be a three tier system urban semi urban and rural for an e court uh, i'm not sure that that division itself will work it will work in the nature of the existing hierarchy uh, in the judicial system between the high court level the district courts and then drilling down to the taluka courts there will be a tiered system and this will be deployed across all those tiers of course uh, third question can at least civil appeals hearing be started in lockdown as paper books are already uh, ready um, can't answer that uh, i think that's a policy decision that will have to be taken at the highest levels uh, there should be no difficulty but i can't i can't answer the, that question of whether it can be done uh, the fourth question is how to register for an e court at the district level i don't know what that means there is no requirement of a registration if you are an advocate who is entitled to practice and there is an e court that is functioning the system that is envisaged uh is that you get a link on your phone or on your email as you've got a link here today to join and imagine that this hearing just now that of uh, this webinar is in fact a court hearing there's really no difficulty and it's no different uh from what we're doing now except that the i as the judge perhaps would be hearing a particular case and i would be hearing let us say mr varun jigar arguing one side of the case and his opponent are uh, arguing the other side of the case that's the only difference between the two systems uh how can a litigant see what his advocate is submitting before a court ah yes uh you know there are levels of participation in a vc hearing uh let's take it from the top the judge or the court the court itself that i am including the court master and so on Uh, those are the ones who have uh, plenary control uh, as mr varunjikar does just now uh, the advocate has a second level of control he can mute or unmute himself but he can't mute or unmute anyone else the litigant would have the uh, a lower level of uh, access where he could only observe so he is in the nature of an observer one question that arises is how does an advocate take instructions from his client or where you have an appeal court how do two judges talk to each other privately when they want to converse now this is an important requirement uh one of the design requirements i think in any uh vc software that is being developed by courts will address precisely this now zoom has this feature it's called a breakout room and uh, we tested it once and if two judges went there uh, into a de- uh, designated breakout room nobody else could hear what they were discussing and similarly a breakout room can be provided for the advocate and his client they can retreat into that it's like an online virtual conference room and the judge will wait for 3 or 4 or 5 minutes uh it, let me just explain this uh, you know all of these applications are actually suboptimal none of them were designed for our workflows in court they were actually designed for corporates for being used for webinars presentations and things like this what have we done we have taken something that was meant for the corporate world and we are trying to adjust our workflow to that app rather than have an app which does or is adapted or designed for our workflow so the new apps that will come the indigenous ones the dedicated ones will be designed with these requirements in mind you know i've discussed this again in another uh, seminar i think mr amit they say was there forget a civil matter in a criminal trial the need for an advocate who is cross examining a prosecution witness to have to be able to take instructions from his client the accused is paramount yet how are they going to maintain social distancing it's one of the challenges we are going to have to face that cross examining lawyer must be able to take instructions in confidence in private from his litigant this will also happen in a trial this can also happen in a trial uh 
on the question of uh, civil trials yes uh, any any other questions now i've got to do that in fact now uh, since you started uh, uh, giving answers to the questions which were uh, uh, hmm. uh, submitted along with pre registration few more uh, questions have come can i share Bound. those questions of course by all means yes uh, how a online verification can be done one uh, important question which is faced by Large number of uh, 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 advocates. How a online verification and what's the solution for that? Ah, the solution is this. Uh, at the moment, it's a little expensive, but I think prices will come down. And again, it was mentioned by Justice Chandrachud yesterday. Digital signatures is an answer to this because they are verified as approved by law by uh, encrypted key pairs, and this allows a verification to happen. once a document is digitally signed you may have noticed this in many orders of the supreme court because we see them as digitally signed we have started doing this in the lockdown period all the high court orders in the lockdown period are digitally signed by our staff they are not actually physically signed by the judges digital signatures is one thing that is going to actually happen uh, there are other problems that uh, unrelated to signatures but we'll have to evolve them one by one there is a one more concern uh, raised by two three uh, participants one is about the security another is a privacy issue in uh, doing this uh, online hearing or e court hearing will you kindly uh, highlight about that yes uh, this has been the topic of some discussion but let me tell you uh, i in i there are classes of matters which by their nature require privacy uh matrimonial matters uh, boxo matters uh, sexual offenses uh these are cases that require privacy and they need to have extreme privacy uh around them whether or not these can or should be done on a platform like this i'm not entirely certain now for the rest of it i'm let's talk about a regular civil matter in court i don't think there's anything terribly private about it and i don't think there's a real security issue in fact i don't think there's a security uh, uh there are great security standards in our physical courts because i myself have experienced this twice once uh, very recently as some of you know uh, an order was forged in my name and then in the name of another judge that is a security breach but that doesn't mean we shut down the high court uh i was hearing a testamentary matter and some lawyer stood up and said that i wanted to mention something so i said yes of course and then i looked up and i saw i said what are you holding in your hand so he said the original papers i said how did you get the original papers from the registry i should be holding the original papers not you now that's the level of security we have in the ordinary course so i'm not terribly worried about this you know if we don't live stream these court hearings there is very little distinction between having a court se- having an online session with let us say 75 or 100 people in attendance and having a courtroom in which 100 people can comfortably sit i can't stop somebody from coming into my courtroom to observe the proceedings he can come it's an open court he may require a pass at the front entrance but once he gets that he should be allowed in what's the difficulty with that i don't see this as a significant issue but but there's a caution you must know how to use that software so somebody in the registry admin must set the security uh, settings in place correctly sir uh, two three lawyers have raised a question uh, about the training which is required training at both the places namely for both the uh, classes one is advocate at large because most of the uh, lawyers are not uh, having a training about this and the honorable judges as well as the staff which is going to use this technology they are not having varun ji this will have to be done on a war footing there is no other word for it i i have my experience and interaction is as with regard to staff um i am told i get conflicting stories i am told on the one hand that our judges at the uh, in the districts and <laughs> otherwise are extremely tech savvy i do not know if this is accurate or inaccurate uh i have no authoritative feedback about the technical competence about of advocates at different levels i just don't know but within the high court 
there is a huge gap between uh, what one set of uh, staff are able to do and what another set of staff are able to do. I there are still staff who are uncomfortable with email, who are unfamiliar with PDF. All of this will have to be sorted out, and they'll have to be brought onto a common platform. One of the things is that you must tell them there is nothing to fear from the technology. I mean, this is, this is it's a tool. It's helping us. It's not it's not a monster that's going to jump out of a screen and eat us. So <laughs> get, get that explain to them. Sir, there was one concern which has been raised by a lawyer, perhaps not from Mumbai. Yes. He is asking a uh, that uh, what will be uh, a, uh, who is going to bear the cost of this all infrastructure development in the court, whether lawyers or whether the honourable judges or the whether government. Definitely, definitely not the court, and uh, and also definitely not the judges. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Uh, uh, they, this, it, it's it's part part of the administration of justice, so it will have to be done. I don't think that the funds are going to be necessarily a problem in that sense. Some of the infrastructure is actually in place and is sanctioned. It just hasn't been, may not have been deployed sufficiently. Some of it will need to be adapted. That's okay. Sir, one uh, suggestion has come. Uh, can there be an online course with reference to this e-code? Uh, uh, whether the High Court can take some initiative. Of course, there. Yes. of course, there can be online training. We have to develop, but to do that so that it is meaningful, we would need to work between the bar and the bench to have a proper curriculum. Uh, with a curriculum like this, you can take it from the basics. What is a doc? What is a PDF? How do you convert from one to the other and so on? And then take it forward from there. It will involve some uh, screen sharing, but lawyers must also be able to dedicate half an hour or 40 minutes a day for that kind of an education or training if they sign up for it. There was one question on on uh, trials. Uh, yes. Should I address that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, trials are going to be a little problematic. At the moment, I think we've not been allowed, uh, uh, we're not for obvious reasons. Uh, it's not been approved. Uh, one is the security thing. Just please understand what happens with a online cross-examination, which is to say, the witness is in a remote location. Now, there are two or three things. As any cross-examiner will tell you, having that witness in the box and the judge seeing the witness, noting his demeanor and seeing how he responds and the speed at which the cross-examiner wants to go are all critical factors to a classic cross-examination. Correct. Nothing can substitute that. If that is not possible, I mean, it is just not possible, and we should not resort to this just lightly. Then a cross-examination by VC is possible. An English court has done this recently. A full trial was done after the lockdown on uh, on uh, VC, including a cross-examination of the witness. Can the witness be tutored? Yes, but you need certain arrangements in place to ensure that that is not happening. In 2014 or 15, in one civil matter that was before me on the original side, we did with the consent of parties a cross-examination because the witness was uh, old, was unable to travel and was in Geneva and somewhere in Europe, I forget where. And he was to be cross-examined. Both sides agreed to this. Uh, I think it's the only cross-examination done remotely overseas uh, in the High Court. But it was possible because not only did both sides agree, but they also agreed to a certain set of stipulations that he would not use any paper or reference material without telling us if he was referring to anything, we would know what he was looking at. So I could make a note of it while this was going on. <laughs> it worked quite effectively and uh, actually progressed a 20 year old suit towards conclusion. Yes. What's the next? Sir, uh, there is one. Uh suggestion from a senior lawyer from the High Court, why all honorable judges are not starting a video conferencing uh, in the High Court also. I'm sure you may not reply to this, but please convey this. No, no, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's a policy decision. I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't answer that because I, I don't know. Uh, there could be an infrastructural I issue as well. Uh, there is definitely an issue about how much, how many staff can attend. 
there until the trains are operational we have we are operating with skeleton staff so we it's uh, not going to be possible for 35 or 40 judges to get together we don't have the staff to support it some of our staff are just inaccessible yes i agree sir now uh, some suggestions have come but uh, we will not trouble uh, your lordship with those suggestions please like share and subscribe thank you